one of the topics that is of great interest right now, if you look at the world, there are certain technologies that are having massive, significant impact in the, the course of human nature or human civilization from here. And I think one of those, one of the things is the idea of the, that we're at the dawn of a new space age. We're going to explore beyond our planet and take people beyond our planet. And that is something that I think is going to significantly impact the way humans think and behave in the future. So I'm going to have a chat with Adriana Moray, who's who's part of the, the Mars One project. So Adriana, first of all, thank you for, thank you for taking some time to chat. Um, I know you do a lot of it. <laughs> um, but it's very. But let's start first of all. You've taken you've taken up a position at SAP. So let's let's kick off with that. What is what is your role within SAP? So yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. <laughs> Pleasure to chat. Um, and be back at the office after a while. <laughs> so I'm head of innovation for Africa at SAP, and I was particularly excited um, to investigate this role within a global software company uh, in terms of doing a bit of matching between kind of emerging technologies and the massive array of challenges that we face, not only in Africa, but mm. I'm specifically looking in that context um, as a South African living on the continent. Um, I think there are gaps that technologies can really fill in terms of um, addressing yeah, these challenges we face with from agriculture to mining to the future of work to so water you, distribution, all of these issues. So are you sort of exploring ways that technology can solve these problems? Is that is that part of your role or is it, I, I mean... Head of innovation, innovation of what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm still exploring exactly what this role, <laughs> what this role entails, but um, so generating uh, thought pieces, whether it's uh, through talking at events or yes. writing articles or, or just general social media interactions. I think it's about about getting the word out there about the existence of these things, mm. and perhaps applying them in ways um, in, a, in a unique way. So I think in the, in the developing world. I think we should do well to look at what developed con com countries and areas have done right and wrong. But I also think, think to some extent even leapfrogging is the wrong term because we don't want to necessarily be going in the same direction uh, as them at all necessarily. Yeah. We need to think carefully about whether we want to leap in the direction that they're going or whether we want to choose our Let's own Let's go from part. nothing to something really bad. There's something to, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, uh, or just because we're in a different scenario, we yes. don't necessarily need to adopt technologies in the way that we see being done globally. Um, I think blockchain is a good example. Um, yes, there's the currency side of it, but in terms of digital identity, for me, this is one of the most compelling applications. And in the African context, um, the uh, World Economic Forum released stats that 1.1 billion humans have no formal identification. Mm. Um, and these are, I don't know how this divides, but it's a group uh, con from Africa and Asia, basically. These yes. 1.1 billion people reside predominantly there. So this is a huge issue for Africa. Never mind, you know, finance. What, pro what problem is solved by dealing with the identity issue? So the word decentralized comes to mind when you're thinking about blockchain and in the identity space, this really makes sense because a lot of these unidentified people are, you know, governments have failed, uh, civil war has caused disruption in the process. Um, and these kind of scenarios are unfortunately abundant on this continent. And if we have a decentralized sort of uh, network capability, basically, where where the um, encryption of, of the information, the security of the network, the um, transparency of these individuals existing and so on, this can be um, done in the, in the block work frame, blockchain framework mm. where you're not necessarily then relying on a government um, to, to take care of <laughs> and yes. be a custodian of your identity, which mm. should be something even more fundamental than the particular country mm. you happen to be living in. Um, this is really a technology okay. that, that can be used for that then, I think. So Estonia is a government that's already started a process like this, but equally we could expand it on an on a African-wide continental level to have a means of identity because access to education finance, uh, healthcare, all of the access to all of these spheres of activity um, depend on your having mm. a means to identify yourself. Mm. And if we can have, you know, a, a technology that's able to be a custodian of this kind of data, um, I think that's an example of, mm. of thinking differently about using So how long, have you been, how long have you been with SAP now? Um, it's been a year and a half, pretty much. Really? Yeah, since last year, oh, Jan. Okay, cool. And okay, and and and, and you're enjoying it. You're it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's a role that didn't exist before, or did it? Uh, there was, was uh, Elka Simon Keller was in my role before me. I, oh, think, okay. I think it was new f with her. So okay, fine. So she handed over the reins. Okay, um. <laughs> okay cool. All well, right, great. Well, let's now take a, take a step out and talk about the whole Mars thing, which which is the thing you, for which you are most known. Uh, but 
a few years ago, two, three years ago, there was uh, there was a lot of talk about it, um, and it, it, we sort of got the sense that it was like really imminent. But wh- where does this this whole Mars One project where does it stand now? So we're excited to have had an, an investor announced, um, not the full sort of 10 billion that we need to get okay. there, but uh, <laughs> some few million euros, which will enable us to progress to the next round, which we've been waiting for as the 100 since okay. 2015. So oh, we've wow. been the okay. international 100 since 2015, and now we're going to enter the next stage, which is to select 40 and then 24 if they stick to the plan, um, and then these 24 would start to train. But in some sense, it's like a chicken and egg thing because we are not a technology company. Mars One is the only entity globally currently um, s- selecting and training crew from from civilians, basically. Wow. So you don't have to be a U.S. citizen to enter a NASA kind of yeah. astronaut training program. European space agencies have similar requirements. So this is the only uh, entity currently. If you want to get to Mars, Mars One is where you need to be. Mm. Um, so this may change, of course, and we are watching keenly um, players like I list them in my mind at least order of priority. So SpaceX um, established with the sole purpose of making humans a multi-planetary species. Uh, yes. I have my money and uh, Elon Musk, South African yeah. born, has my support. And I, uh, yeah, um, we are extremely excited to see how that develops amongst as many other endeavors to save the world. So hopefully uh, he has time left over to really <laughs> get the first humans off of Earth to Mars in the next decade or so, which has been the plan. Okay. And, and uh, Adriana, I mean, I, okay, so there's a hundred and that's going to be ultimately how how many go in the end like uh, on the first trip how how many go Uh, so I mean Mars One has a a outline of how they plan to do it but again it's completely dependent on the technology and and if Elon um, builds the BFR, the big, the big rocket. <laughs> you can uh, say the rest yeah. of the <laughs> um, That will, that will be able to take a hundred people at a time. Okay. So then it may be a case of some seats will be allocated and mm. paid for by Mars One, and the mm. others would be allocated and paid for by whoever uh, pays the money, because mm. Elon has said, "I build the train, you buy the tickets." Okay. So it's that kind of scenario where planning too much in advance is probably going to be detrimental. Uh, this is really the most ambitious and exciting project that uh, any life form on Earth has ever embarked Absolutely. on, as far as we know. Okay, um, fine. So well, okay, so then I'm, uh, in a I moment. Think, I think we, uh, yeah, let's. Uh, no, uh, step at a time. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Okay. So there's all the usual questions, which I may get to, that I'm sure you've been asked multiple times. But what I'm interested in is why, why is this a thing? Why, I mean, as a, as a, as a citizen of Earth, and, and I, just the concept of it is, is mind-boggling and amazing. And I th- certainly think it's an incredible thing, this idea of taking humans to another world. But in a broader sense, why is it important? Why should $30 billion be spent doing this? For, for, what, for what benefit? Why? Why? So I think um, a lot of people ask why we haven't been back to the moon. And let me use that as the framework to then talk about why we need to get to Mars. I think, uh, and in my opinion, I, I'm s- I still fluctuate on what I really think about why we haven't been back to the moon. Um, but... I think the spirit in which it was done was not uh, not the optimal way to explore, and that's namely like as an act of war or as a uh, act of show of power, let's say, or a political muscle flexing activity, which then makes it unsustainable. And a lot of resources were put in. It was a huge leap. It was like achieve, achieving the really near impossible. The kind of technological development curve mm. that was required to get to the moon is far steeper, in my opinion, than the one to get to Mars. Really? Yeah. Um, okay, considering we, we have computers, we yes. have uh, you know propulsion systems that yes. we've been testing over the last few decades. These are sufficient to sort of reuse plus minus some increments to get to Mars as well. So I think the spirit in which the Mars landing was done is the reason we haven't been back. And I think it's crucial for us now to do things in the right spirit. And there's a lot of, a lot of things that need to be done on Earth too. And certainly um, most people need to stay here and fix that, um, or at least endeavor to mm, mm. be part of projects that are trying to fix the huge challenges we face here on Earth. We're on an unsustainable trajectory and we're, things are speeding up and we don't know where we're gonna be sort of 10, 20 years from now. Um, but I think space exploration, if it's done in the spirit of curiosity driven, you know, um, exploration, this is going to stimulate multiple industries. Mm. And we saw that even in the Apollo era, although we didn't go back to the moon since 1972, that the internet, the personal computer, the mm. mobile phone are argued in a number of research articles to have been correlated with the cohorts of students who by the inspiration of watching wow. that landing yes. on TV or listening to it on the radio enrolled in STEM degrees. 
and went into mm. their professions thinking that they could achieve what seemed to be impossible. And mm. we've got things like the internet. I mean, our proudest moment is humanity, in my opinion, this global communications network, um, as a result, <coughs> arguably, indirectly from the inspiration that was the Apollo mission. Mm. So getting to Mars is, it's not really about the budget that we spend on getting there. It's about, I think, achieving what seems to be impossible, mm. reaching for big dreams, uh, expanding beyond you know, what, what's known. I think it's important to get out of your comfort zone to really stimulate growth development as a species and as a person, as people you know, on all levels. Um, and I think this Mars mission is probably what we need as a society. Um, we're seeing a lot of sort of frac f I don't know, um, fractured mm, <laughs> kind of polarized. nations, yeah. polarization and politics, yes, these things. And I think this would really bring us together again, mm. potentially as, as a species, as a society of Earth, um, that this is a project in which we can all you know, get behind. For me, what, uh, what I think is incredible about it is just that, well, human curiosity, human striving to, to know more, to understand, to kind of break down and figure out what the hell's going on around us has, has brought us to, to a time in the world where, where we are, uh, despite, uh, I mean, as we sit here, we've got CNN playing in the background. <laughs> and, 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 and as, you, as you read the headlines, you're like, Disaster. okay, oh, why are we even bothering? But in truth, this is the healthiest, safest and most prosperous time in human history. You know, uh, I disagree. <laughs> no, I, but by no, but by any measure, that is that is that is true. You know, I think we're teetering on the brink of uh, we may destruction. Well be. No, uh, no, no. We we may well be, mm. but it doesn't take away from the fact that what we've overcome to be where we are. Um, and if we sure, if we've we, come a long way. If we look I at agree. if we look at disease, if we look at. Uh, Famine. If we, you know, we have reduced these issues, and you know, poverty remains a massive issue, but it has been steadily decreasing over time. So, technology and, and uh, human striving has brought us to this point. We are, I think, at a very important point where things can go uh, one of a couple of ways. But having a project like this, where we go, okay, let's go and let's go and colonize another planet, is 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 pretty awesome. And I, and I think just the the fact that we well, the fact that we're even trying is amazing. Mm. This alone that can stimulate. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and and it, does, mm. it does stimulate. If, if it gets pulled off and it happens, it's, uh, I think, going to blow all our minds and, and I think will help to stimulate something better or at least ignite that innate human nature desire to be like, hey, look, at, look how awesome we are. Let's do something amazing rather than try and kill each other or all the other things we're doing. So now we get to, I mean... It, Technologically, it's a, it's a mind-boggling challenge, and uh, you know, one of my uh, my bad habit now is I fall asleep to YouTube. That's kind of uh, <laughs> now I struggle if I don't have YouTube, I struggle to fall asleep. <laughs> and I happened to come across a, a a thing on Mars. I don't know who did it. It was like an hour-long documentary talking about well, just the history of Mars, and it's always been a fascination. Mm. Uh, people have always been fascinated by Mars, but just. I mean, there's so much that surely is unknown, like the, you know, the long-term effect. Never mind the journey there. Let's let's assume that all goes well and you're you're on there. You know, what what are the long-term effects of of one third of the gravity of of the how are these things? Why would you think that's a good idea? I mm. mean, at a personal level, at a at a human level, it sounds fantastic. But at a personal level, what? Why do you go? Yeah, that sounds like an awesome idea. So I still wanted to revisit like, and try and make precise why I said I disagree with you. And, yes. and that, let me tie that into this question, okay. hopefully, if I get that right <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> with my jet lag brain. Um, so I'd, I'd say the reason why I say today is not necessarily um, in a better state than 100 years ago is not looking on individual levels of, of standards of living, yes. but rather the state of the planet. Um, and this has implications for why we may need to understand what happened to Mars. So Mars once had oceans. Mm. This is sort of mainstream belief. We see canyons, um, areas that we associate with flowing water or liquid at least. Water would be logical because we see some water crystals mm. remaining on Mars. We see pebbles also uniquely mm. associated with moving water. So there's evidence for shorelines, etc. We think Mars once had oceans. What happened to Mars's oceans? And what effect will our activity and indeed the general um, dynamics that happen on planets result in on our planet Earth? Mm. So planets go through changes. I mean, there's evidence of snowball Earth, where Earth was once covered completely in ice all the way around. 
um, and the, uh, let me not get the number wrong, but snowball earth yeah. <laughs> is a thing. So earth has gone through many changes. I yeah. mean, the situation that we're in now uh, is uh, not unique. It's not unprecedented, and certainly earth will go through periods of climate change in the future. But but our impact here, and maybe at the at the cost of the health of the planet, is how we've managed to raise our living standards. Mm-hmm. And as okay. you say, preventing disease, having more access to food than we may have as you know more primitive humans. Um, I think the, the damage that we're doing to the planet in, in enabling that kind of standard of living is worrying. Um, the trajectory we're on in terms of resource management is not sustainable. And it's possible that we've passed the ecological tipping point. Uh, the rate of change of things is increasing, uh, not to look at the CNN weather yeah. <laughs> reports, but there are certain indications that we may be past the tipping point. Um, and I'm not here to talk doom and gloom, but these are interesting um, perspectives and we don't know much about planets in mm. general. We know a little bit about one. Um, so getting to Mars would really be hugely important to have another data point in terms of understanding global climate changes in our solar system. Um, at some point, the Earth, the Sun will go red giant and envelop mm. first Earth and then the, and then Mars. So uh, in a billion year time frame, we need to start thinking about leaving this planet mm. anyway. And why don't why, no time like the present to start yes. practicing doing that? Um, but on another level, these sort of Per probably human-induced uh, massive changes that we're seeing in the climate on Earth um, will have implications for how we live and how we are going to manage our resources. And I think a settlement on Mars would be a perfect uh, um, testing ground mm. and development a sandbox, if you like, for developing, you know, indoor food uh, greenhouses. Call it what you will. This vertical mm. farming, precision farming, where all of the conditions in which you grow the food are controlled. Um, I think with, uh, you know, Africa has the highest rates of urbanization. This is how we'll survive on mm. Mars is by growing our food in indoor, um, completely controlled environments. And increasingly, this is how we're going to need to grow more and more of our food on Earth. You know, m- great areas of, of where we're living now are no longer going to be habitable. I mean, Cape Town's, uh, we've seen the water crisis mm. there, and a lot of areas are earmarked to have less water than before. So having these controlled indoor systems that use 95% less water is going to be essential going mm. forward. So this is just one example of a technology that's going to be absolutely necessary on Mars and how developing it and having research teams throw you know hours and, and money mm. at the problem will result in developments that are also going to be beneficial back here on Earth. Um, even clean air, you know, this will be obviously a, a huge task on Mars is to mm. prepare a breathable, breathable oxygen because it's 96% carbon dioxide. But those um, that kind of thinking and those kind of systems um, may well be necessary in the future of Earth where we spend more time mm. indoors um, in uh, conditioned units uh, in terms of maybe things getting hotter, in terms of air pollution we're already seeing. Um, we're needing to find ways to, to you know, get clean air mm. and so thinking on these scales about basics basics so i've talked about water i've talked mm. about food air um, energy is mm. probably the most fundamental of all and on mars we would endeavor to be purely solar powered there's talk of nuclear systems as well but certainly there's no, not going to be any coal burning <laughs> uh, <laughs> bringing coal okay. to mars is not feasible finding and it there is surprising in its own right yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow <laughs> okay. so all solar powered <clears throat> thin film photovoltaics as as like uh, low in mass as possible to transport them there and these are the kind of things mm. you need to be thinking about on earth too so taking it back okay so th- i mean there's two w- when you talk about this project i mean there's there's, there's two elements to this one is <coughs> uh the grand human endeavor mm. and the issues you're highlighting of the sustainability on this planet and our drive to do greater things but then there is is a very individual human story attached to this with a hundred people who said okay cool i want to go well there were hundreds of thousands of people that said they want to go it's been sort of narrowed down how do you how do you live a life in preparation of something i mean it's not if you had a definite date it's like okay you're leaving on this date in eight years time or ten years time you kind of plan around that but there's a bit of ambiguity around Mm. it i mean how does that affect your I mean, I mean i mean the way you live i mean you've got a job now and you've got things to do and but uh, I, I, or maybe, do you not think about it how because that's quite interesting to me where mm. it's like uh, okay what if i am i going to get married i'm not going to you know generally our sort of lives are tend to <clears throat> tend to be mapped out for us whereas for you not so much well <laughs> uh, the, my, my standard response to that question is my mm. tomorrow is no more or less certain than anyone's okay um, you know, we don't know how long we've got uh, on this planet. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And um, volunteering to Mars seems as though it's putting me in a more uncertain position. I would argue it's not. Okay. And I think embracing the uncertainty that we cannot 
determine what tomorrow will bring until we get there um, is the kind of um, embracing that we should all be doing of, yes. of, of the uncertainty of tomorrow and therefore living today as though it might be you know one of the last days that we have the chance to live so that means appreciating what we have um, and uh, doing the best that we can bit by bit but uh, of course planning the future I mean uh, yeah having children or starting a family has never been top on my list probably yes. like very far down well, like, you know, <laughs> pages and pages should I, should I down be investing on the list? in my retirement <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I am through some kind of policy. I, I never really paid much attention to that kind of thing. So I think it's about personalities. Um, there would be those kind of people who, in a heartbeat, uh, you, you know, I guess the people who jumped on Christopher Columbus's ship mm. or on a an mission to Antarctica to find the pole, those kind of people who would drop everything to, to do something that's bigger than them. Um, seeing beyond my own sort of personal views about what my tomorrow should bring and say this is something important and my insignificant life in the history of the planet is something I'm prepared to that's all I have to give wow, okay. and I would give it for that um, to do something that's got more of an impact than just you know me having a comfortable retirement like mm. that that wouldn't be something I would really aim towards um, and I think it's important that we all find purpose and not everyone needs to volunteer for Mars, please. We're trying to keep the competition down here. But I think it's really important to find that purpose that's bigger than yourself. Um, that's uh, To lead a fulfilling life, I think, is to find a purpose that's greater than are, you and to dedicate are, are yourself you still, to it. Are you still personally excited by it? About, I mean, when it, I mean, when was it, like 2012, 13? 13, 13 when, when, when I volunteered. Yeah, okay, then... And and then there was the culling of the list, and then you got told, okay, you're in the you're in the 100. What was what was your response to that? I mean, was it like? Uh, once I volunteered, I kind of knew I, yeah, I would go all the way, um, okay. or do everything in my power to so go it wasn't all like, the way. Adriana, you've been selected. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, okay, good. We're on track. We're on okay. track. <laughs> all right. Super excited. No, I mean, it, it. It's not that I don't think about it. It, it is. It is who I am now. It's inextric yes. inextricably part of me, and uh, it's not guaranteed that I go, of course, of course. But until I breathe my last breath, I will be proposing that this is the next step for our society, and we need to do everything that we can. Um, I just think 4.5 4 billion years, that's how old the planet is, Yes. as uh, far as we know scientifically. Um, so 4.5 billion years is quite a long time in proportion to the human lifetime. And we are prone to a single point of failure. Like mm. uh, we are you know, vulnerable to multiple ways in which our whole planet could be extinguished with all life on it at the same mm. time. Like life will probably find a way and the planet will probably continue. But I just feel like the information that's been generated, mm. the evolution, the complexity that's emerged, um, uh, I believe in evolution, of course, as a scientist. Um, I think that the time that it's taken for all of those steps from the bacterium... It would be a terrible waste. ...first emerged all the yes. way up to now, it would just be a waste. And uh, it's like backing up a data, a data backup, yes. you know. <laughs> Even if no one survived, if we could at least but store all the DNA of all the things that have been here and put them on a library on the moon no, somewhere true. safe, you know. That would be the minimum um, acceptable option, I would say. Keeping some of these things yes. alive, even better, you know. Cause, well, uh, from an evolutionary point of view, certainly... As soon as we have humans settled on Mars, surely we've now taken human civilization is now on a different evolutionary track of some sort. I mean, because I mean, I, th I believe we're destined to be a into multi planetary mm. uh, society. I mean, that's the end point of becoming intelli uh, an intelligent. Yes. Arguably, we're not there yet. Um, we, <laughs> you know, maybe we're on the brink of becoming intelligent. I'm not sure, but um, to be able to expand ourselves into the space that we mm. find ourselves in, not to stay on the surface of the rock that we emerged mm. on. I think that's definitely a next a next point and uh, yeah. Okay, so let's assume let's assume this all goes according to target. And by the end of the next decade there's a twenty people, hundred people, whatever, on Mars and there's a settlement forming. With that first incredibly important advance, how long before a Martian is born. Yeah, well, so to have a child, you need quite a lot of infrastructure. Mm. So I'd say a few decades, certainly, maybe a population of at least a thousand. So genetically, if you want to start from that baseline, mm. like how many people do you need? Okay, arguably, you could bring samples from Earth to sure. increase the diversity, yeah. but let's say you're just using the people there, about a thousand is known to be a viable diversity of genetics. Okay. Um, and the Mars One project has specifically selected people from all over the world, not yes. only for genetic diversity, but for diversity of culture, etc. So a thousand people, I mean, because these thousand people are going to have to run the kindergarten, yes. um, the clinic, the mm. hospital, eventually the university where these children are going to grow up. Um, 
children need to play and have you mm. know fun time and uh, until we've at least managed to create some spaces yes. within the settlement where this is possible i'd say it would be unethical to introduce a human to such a dire <laughs> kind of yes. circumstance against their will so uh, for adults above 18 and all the and most made their candidates yeah, they've sure. made their choice <laughs> so so it could be decades i would say for sure well yeah. i think because what's interesting to me is uh, getting people and, and and forming a settlement on mars is is a massive achievement absolutely but from, I mean, human civilization, I think, changes fundamentally once someone is born on Mars. Because mm. that is, because now we are then it's really... it's sustainable... Ta- correct. Settle, yeah. and, and we have gone another way. Mm. And it's quite likely that that person will grow up and never know Earth. Mm. And be told stories about it, but have never... I mean, this is home. This is all I've ever known. And that, uh, I think, psychologically, fundamentally, is new and... But if we're thinking about what the Mars settlement will look like initially, probably Antarctica is probably the closest mm. thing if people want to try and imagine where, and I'm guessing it's not going to be national, like Ant- Antarctica is where countries have their bases, but probably companies or collectives um, that collaborate yes. and set their, their stuff up. So Mars One may have some part of it, some mm. different crew that joins on the BFR or SpaceX may have some yeah. other settlement, probably not too far away from each other because sharing of resources and uh, knowledge and software and all of these things will be crucial initially. So that's how we could envisage it, I guess. So, so I guess another an element to this, which, which is, uh, I just got finished watching a, a series called uh, The Terror, which which was a, a fictionalized account of um, a disastrous expedition in the 1840s to try and find the North a Passage through through the Arctic to you know, connect Asia and, and England. Um, and they the two ships and they got trapped in the ice and it, whatever. It had, all 133 people were lost. Um, oh. And it took it took ages to find out what happened. And, and even to this day, we're not entirely sure what happened because there weren't accurate records kept and mm. whatever. And of course, lack of communication and so on. But 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 that was that, that was the nature of exploration in those days is like we're going to go find something we're not even sure if it exists but we're going to go and check it mm-hmm. out and and no one leaves going i'm going to die on this you know it's, it's not going to work out you go there with you know we're optimistic we're going to mm-hmm. make it happen and given the nature of and every time a every time an expedition went out and it failed or whatever there was better technology that came after we learn lessons we learn we get better and better and better and better at it and uh but with something like this, I mean, you would expect, I mean, the, all the mistakes are going to happen on the first couple, or, or uh, the, the big mistakes are going to happen, like, oh, shit, okay, well, we better not do it that way in the future, but, <laughs> but I mean, but you're, you're, you're in the beta, you're or the alpha, that, you know, it's, it's the very, very first, with the likelihood of stuff going wrong, I mean, it's very real. I mean, I, I have a friend who said to me, like, sort of under his breath, he was like, Listen, I'm going to call it now. I think they're all going to die. <laughs> you know? Eventually, we all will. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know how much of that. I mean, and obviously, it can't occupy all your thoughts because if we, we worried about all the ways we would die, we'd never get out of bed. Um, so, no, I, I think I'm afra- afraid of dying a meaningless death on Earth. You know, wow, no yeah. death on Mars would be meaningless, even if it's halfway there. Okay. So, it would be meaningful regardless. So, I'm not afraid of dying doing something meaningful. Okay, and in, in, in the sense that something would come. Uh, Something would be learned from it to make it to make it better to make it. Yeah, I mean, it might be nice to think of sending I don't know animals or uh, <laughs> I don't know on the first mission to test it out as we have yes. done in the past, like sending poor like to space. <laughs> um, but in fact, the, the success of that first mission will be crucial. And you're right, a lot of things will go wrong. But I think you need to send the best crew first um, because if that first mission fails on a funding level on a practical level, it's very difficult to get public support for a second follow-up yes. mission. Um, we've seen what happened with the ch- Challenger disaster mm. and uh, the Virgin Virgin Galactic mm. disaster. So, I mean, loss of human life is obviously to be avoided at all costs, not only because of the loss of human life as the priority, mm. but also because of the real difficulty in re-establishing you know, faith in the project after that. So I think it's crucial that the first are the best. And I, then I would want to be one of them to, to take on those challenges mm. and try to solve them because... Um, people who believe that this is possible and believe that this is what they meant to do with their lives are going to be the ones who persevere longer, push through barriers further and hopefully survive and yeah, in time for the next crew to arrive with mm. whatever backup supplies were needed. Certainly lots of things will go wrong, but having that grit and that belief um, is what's going to be required of the first crew, I believe. Okay. So as it stands now, how long is the journey? 
Uh, seven months. So actually, right now there's a NASA mission that was launched um, in May. I think it was. It'll land on the 26th of November. Okay. So this will be the eighth su- successful, hopefully, landing on mm. the surface of Mars, all by NASA. So NASA is the only entity, what, what are they and it, it takes seven months. So. Okay. And what are they sending? Um, it's a, a probe that's going to land, well, a lander that will then dig down further than we've oh, ever okay. done before okay. to investigate the the thermal activity, the um, composition of of the interior of Mars. Mm. Something we haven't investigated in detail before. Um, whether the conditions there may be, you know, warm enough for life. These kinds of questions. So they're going to look okay. down below the surface. Um, they'll, the mission will dig to five meters, I think, inside. It's called. Mm. So exciting. We can watch mm. that in November. That'll be the f- uh, next landing since the Curiosity rover mm. um, in 2012, I think it was. Yeah. So that that takes seven months. So that's what we're capable of doing right now is sending a few tons on a seven-month approximate journey to land on Mars. So the difference with the crew would be that it not it's not going to be a few tons. It's going to be a few tens of tons. Mm. Um, estimates range between 30 to 50 to 60 depending mm. um, that would be for a crew of four mm. so with the hundred the crew of 100 um, there's yeah, going to be multiple launches from crazy, earth yeah. um, to rendezvous with the thing that's in orbit and, yeah. then, and then depart from low earth orbit um, so different designs depending on how much mass you're taking with you uh, but yeah the complexity and, there's and, the extra and, and mass do you, and do you think it's going to be because the reality We've all seen sci- sci-fi movies of space travel, and they and, and the ships are small, but but they're walking around, and there's a there's a kitchen, and there's mm-hmm. a and it looks like there's proper comfort. Whereas the re- like if you look at the space station, it just looks cross- claustrophobically uh, small. Uh, so if it if there are a hundred of you going, how big is this thing? I mean, are you mm-hmm. going to be able to no, walk tiny. around? And it's a, like uh, twice as much as Christopher Columbus's sailors had on board. <laughs> <laughs> which wow. is not uh, 20 meters cubed or something yeah. like that, I think. I mean, this is the proposal. Again, it completely depends sure. on who builds the no, technology. No, 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 no. So Mars One puts numbers to it, but it's a bit <laughs> premature. <laughs> yeah. um, but this, apparently, I, saw, I was at the Farnborough Air Show last, uh, when it was on in London recently, and um, Tim Peake, the British astronaut, was there. And he said it's quite spacious in the space station. I suppose that weightlessness gives you a yes. sense of freedom somehow. Okay. No, um, and our space would be much smaller than that. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Okay. All right, fine. As we as as we come to the end of this and and and, and wrap it up. So from a timing point of view, um, so if everything kind of goes, you get the, the funding happens and the whatever when, and and you are selected to be among those first to go. When does this happen? I mean, when do you go into training? So the training is dependent on the funding, which now that we've got the f- the next round sort of yeah. covered, hopefully that would stimulate our, our business so model, which, 2020, is, which is broadcasting. Twenty twenty, the money's in place, and there's a so money's no longer the issue. We we're full steam ahead. Then we still have a problem with the technology. So I'd say for Mars ah. One, the budget <laughs> for Mars One, the budget is the priority because we can be training nonetheless. Yes. But to pay the salaries of mm. of the trainees for decades while you wait for SpaceX to get the launch right and mm. the landing right, um, the, you know it's it's a difficult yes. trade-off between balancing these two things. So we're watching keenly whether so Blue Origin is focusing more on space tourism and the moon. Okay. Um, Jeff Bezos in an interview has said the step-by-step approach. So he's it's his belief that we skipped steps going to the moon and that's why we haven't gone back he believes we need to develop you know um, uh, capabilities and okay. uh, more close to home i.e the moon first and then that would be the stepping stone by which we can sustainably go to mars so it seems like blue origins focusing more on things closer to home then we've got spacex who's purely endeavoring to get to mars so my money and hope is that they mm-hmm. will successfully land as a private company for the first time a cargo mission on mars in the next few years okay. elon has said 2020 he's ambitious usually with his deadline mm-hmm. so or his uh, time frame so let's say early 2020s of SpaceX lands successfully then the question is how many successful launches would you personally uh, require like, to yes. consider the thing safe because yes. three successful launches in a row could mean you, you know number four is the one that fails <laughs> <laughs> or ten in a row sounds yes. good but can you afford it um, yeah. probably several cargo missions would need to be uh, implemented to deliver cargo to so is that going to be first sort of, so that would be the test so, that's, and, and so it's A a test and B it's delivering stuff delivering you cargo so if, while it, you uh, if it blows up on landing fine it was just uh, some habitat stuff. components <laughs> or the food that we were going to eat but yeah. you can re-deliver that okay. so it's all about the testing the okay. sort of fine line of what is safe when it's <laughs> so okay so, so it's fairly there's there's a lot of moving parts to I think this. we need a, a lot, lot of passion we need Absolutely. money we need technology but mostly we need passion I think and that's been what I've taken upon myself the last few years is to to talk to people about okay. this um 
not only to convince people that this is what we need to do as a society, but hopefully to get people thinking bigger than what they are currently, than yes. how they currently are. I think it's through big thinking alone that we're going to be able to solve challenges on this planet and beyond, and to find a purpose. Um, so we have these big challenges. Once we zoom out and look on Earth objectively, we have huge, huge issues in terms of planetary health um, and you know the future of our society on this planet and maybe others. And I think finding a purpose for one's life. It uh, doesn't have to be going to Mars, but actively contributing towards making the future a better place. Uh, I think this is something we all need to do. Fabulous. Well, well done for everything you've done and good luck. And I hope, I really, I hope it works out. Uh, I, I didn't sign up. I didn't volunteer, <laughs> but uh, certainly I'm cheering and supporting. So well done. Thank Thanks you. for the thoughtful questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. And also, Major Honorable, yeah. thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Ryan. Right. <laughs> 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 well, there we go. I guess that's been... The new normal with Ryan Hogarth, and thank you.